Hello everyone and welcome back to Scandinavian Design 101. I'm Sanna. I'm Andreas and we are two Swedes and we love design. And this is our second and final part of our introdu uh, introduction to the French construction designer, engineer and self-thought architect Sean Prové. And if you haven't watched the first video already, it's a good thing to do that first. Mm -hmm. uh, last week we handled the early years of Prové's career and today we will start in the 1940s. Yeah. The Jean Prové studio's profits were invested in new machinery needed to handle new materials mm. such as wood and aluminum mm. due to the steel shortage during the German occupation. Some furniture had to be made in wood instead of the intended metal. During the war, Prové designed demountable barracks for the French army and his workshop also actively participated in the resistance by dismantling and reworking the railway lines. Yeah. <laughs> For this, he was elected mayor of Nancy for a few months between 1944 and 45, actually. <laughs> That's cool. Mm -hmm. After the war, the company moved into new, much larger workshops in the outskirts of Nancy. This move was completed in 1947. The following period is known as Prevé's most productive. The workshop produced a long range of demountable houses, furniture, windows, doors, kitchens, wall mm. and roof elements, etc. <laughs> The Prevé Studios now employs more than 200 workers mm. and caught the attention of other companies, but we'll get back to that. Yeah. Let's talk about some of the furniture made during this time. Yeah. Uh, in 1941, he uh, did his first version of the Garidon table uh, with round tabletop, but serial production of it wasn't started until 1949. And these tables are easy to recognize by the triangular arrangement of legs. Uh, the table was produced in a numerous series in different materials, sizes and shapes. And another version with a rectangular tabletop was called the EM. And some of these are in production today by Vitra and can be yours for yeah as little as like between uh, two and a half and three thousand dollars. Ish. Yeah, ish. And old ones are of course much more difficult to come by and expensive on the second hand market. Uh, in the fall of 2021, the auction house Philips sold a table with a rectangular aluminum tabletop for 281,000 US dollars. And that sounds much, but in December 2021, Sotheby's sold a similar table with a mahogany tabletop for as much as 1,714,000 uh, dollars. So that, that's much for a oh, table. So <laughs> yeah. buy a new one. Buy a new <laughs> one. No, buy an old one if you can. But, oh, uh, if you can. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Next, we're going to talk about the Visiteur chair, a progression of the Cité armchair mm. constructed of wood instead of steel. It was designed for a hospital, but it soon became popular for home use as well. Mm. While trying to perfect the chair, Provia made many, many versions with adjusted stability, lightness and toughness. Toughness? Yes, toughness. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> If you like the cartoon Tintin, yeah, as I uh, some people in <laughs> yeah. here do, you might have seen this chair. It's featured in the adventures of uh, Tintin in Tibet. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You've seen it. Yeah, yeah of yeah. course. We read it and see it. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Of course. Of yeah. course. And now moving on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this chair is not in production today, uh, today, so if you want one, you'll have to buy it on auction. But it's rarely sold. Philips sold one in 2017 for two hundred and sixty-six thousand dollars, and Sotheby's sold one in 2020 for one hundred and six thousand dollars. Yeah. The FV22 version was sold by Christie's in 2021 for the impressive sum of eight hundred and seventy-eight thousand US dollars. Yeah, that's so. Maybe you can have one. Yeah, that is. It's a lot of money, but it's a cool share. <laughs> Not that cool. <laughs> Moving on. Ah, okay. Uh, the compass table was developed in 1953 and initially intended to be a disassembled uh, modular system. Uh, but when put into production, this idea was dropped. I think it was too difficult to, to, to make it in pieces. Hmm. Uh, the tabletop rests on a base constructed from round tubing and triangular legs. Um, the first version was asymmetrical, but uh, soon several other versions followed, among them desks, coffee tables and classroom furniture. 
Um, and the asymmetrical compass direction is nowadays produced by Vitra and it's sold for about $4,000. Old compass tables are frequently sold at quality auctions and in 2016 Philips sold a curved desk for $41,000 and they also sold a cafe table for $39,000 I think it was on the same auction. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and then I found a huge 4 meter conference table lacking the tabletop, it was oh. just the base oh, oh, and oh. it was sold by Doroteum in 2010 for $71,000 oh. but it's, it's a huge one and if you have a company with a lot of money it's a statement piece. Next the Anthony chair. Mm -hmm. It's difficult to place chronologically because no sketches of it exist today. Some sources place it around 1950 when Prouvé and Charlotte Perriand collaborated in a competition to develop furniture for the University of Strasbourg. Mm -hmm. Documents in the Prouvé archive tells us the, chair, the chair's production year was 1954. According to the archive, the chair was designed for a competition for creating furniture for another Cité University located in Anthony, yeah. a suburb of Paris. Yeah. It's a highly sculptural mm -hmm. chair and uh, the thin bentwood shell rests lightly on the robust industrial looking mm -hmm. base. Vitra reissued the chair in 2002, but it's no longer in production. Wow. Some of the reeditions can from time to time be found on the second hand market, so the prices varies a lot. Yeah. Old chairs are very hard to find. <laughs> In 2021, one of these rare chairs were sold by Christie's for $34,000. Yeah, and this is a very cool chair and it's it it's uh, more modern looking than yeah. uh, the rest of the chairs yeah. by Provea. It's almost like this Danish modern looking. Or, Actually, uh, yes. Yeah. Not the steel though. No, not the steel, but this Curb, floating yeah. seat. Mm. Uh, it's, it's very elegant in a way. Very nice. Not characterized by the other furniture by mm -mm. Provea, no. And we must also mention the Potence wall lamps. Uh, the first version was designed for Provea's own home in Nancy in 1947. And it was simply a pivoting piece of tubular steel held by a steel wire. Mm. Yeah, I'm thinking of friends. Yeah. When, uh, pivot. <laughs> uh, no, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, and yeah, well, this functional, de functional design was later produced in different sizes, perfect in like factories as well as private homes. In 1950, Provea developed a larger version uh, for the tropical houses in Brazzaville, Congo. <laughs> And this version of the Potan's lamp had a wooden handle making it possible to uh, easily turn the lamp when sitting beneath it. So oh. we can turn it in um, 180 yeah, yeah. Uh, degrees. That's nice. Yeah, it's a very good looking lamp too. Um, and both of these lamps are nowadays reissued by Vitra. And the small one sold for uh, $1,400 uh, and the large one for $2,150. And old lamps are sometimes offered for sale at auction. And I found, found a huge three and a half meter version oh. of the, this uh, with a wooden, hand, mm -hmm. wooden handle sold by Christie's in 2021 for as much as $250,000. So that's expensive. But it's a lot of lamp. It's a lot of lamp mm -hmm. and that's the largest lamp I've ever seen <laughs> of, ever? of these oh, uh, Provea okay. lamps. <laughs> yeah. In 1941, the Aluminum Francais concern invested in Jean Prové Studios and with that gaining shares of the business that would increase over the years. Some months later, Prové signed a contract with a sister company to the Aluminum concern called Studol and gave them the exclusive rights to sell the workshop's products. <laughs> this was, as you can imagine, a mistake. Yeah. He came to lose control over his business, changes were made that Provea didn't like, and by 1952 he was de denied access to his own <laughs> workshops okay. by the stockholding majority. I don't really know why. No, but they will. They wanted to like get rid of him, yeah, and they just earned so, a lot of money. Yeah, yeah, but they wanted it's... to earn a lot of money from yeah, from the products. Stupid. Yeah. The important prototype manufacturing department was shut down. Hmm. The year after, he resigned and would never set foot in the workshops again. No. With that, he lost everything. His workshops, his staff, and also the copyrights to his designs. And like that, his furniture manufacturing days were over. Oh. He have later said that I died in 1952. <laughs> that's sad. Oh, that's but... super sad. Yeah. 
However, he still had the rights to use around 30 of his inventions that he had filed patents on, ranging from removable metal door and mm-hmm. window systems to metal frame constructions and so on. Yeah. After a few bad years, he and his friend, the architect uh, Michel Bataille, uh, together founded Les Constructions Jean Trouvé in Paris in 1952. Uh, no, oh. in uh, 1956, yeah. of course. <laughs> <laughs> With his now large family of five children still living in Nancy, he was forced to commute between Nancy and his uh, Paris office, mm. a trip that took more than four hours. Today. Uh, today. Check, Perhaps yeah. it took like five or possibly. six hours then. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. possibly. And um, it wasn't... Uh, the, the roads can't have been as great uh, back I think then. So. No, no. Did the cars go as fast? No, I don't think so oh. either. <laughs> Took the whole afternoon. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we did. Yeah. But Provea, who loved company, hated the long trips alone and therefore often picked up hitchhikers in his sports car. Um, and sometimes he even let them stay the night and his family would wake up with a stranger in the living room. Uh, <laughs> strange. And, but he survived. And, <laughs> yeah, they, they all did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mm. Uh, the new business was limited to just designing, and soon Provea was uh, looking forward for more practical work. Uh, already in 1957, he got the chance to do so when the company CIMT decided to found a new uh, construction department, and they took over the new Provea studio and made him the head of the department working on different types of facade solutions. Mm-hmm. He left this company in 1966 Mm -hmm. and founded yet another office advising architects to help realizing their projects. Mm -hmm. And in 1971, he was honored to be chairman of the competition committee that would choose which architectural team would build the new modern art museum, the Centre Pompidou. Oh, that's... Pompidou. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) It's fun to say. Yeah. The winners were decided, and this choice polarized the architectural Mm. world. Provea was not an educated nor registered Mm. architect, and yet he got to decide. (laughs) During this time, society was very skeptical of industrialized buildings. Mm. Provea's uh, post-war building methods were, by some, associated with accommodations for the poor. Yeah. Which is a nice thing. Yeah, that's a very nice uh, thing. So uh... Snobby French people. Yeah. <laughs> Until his death in 1984, mm. he continued to be an engineering and architectural consultant mm. with no diplomas in either field. <laughs> no. He had a remarkable career and uh, nowadays he's often one of the most appreciated architects of his time. Mm-hmm. Remembered as a true pioneer in the field of industrial production. Yes. Ironically, as with most modernists, <laughs> the furniture by Provi were intended to be cheap and accessible to the broad masses. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Instead, they become very, very expensive collectibles sold for huge sums of money to only celebrities and rich collectors. Yeah, sadly. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is the end of our uh, uh, second uh, video about uh, Jean Prové. Yeah. And some people get a bit confused here because we are talking a lot now recently about uh, non-Scandinavian designers. Yeah. But we think it's interesting to talk about uh, all kinds of design and uh, design from all around the world because you can't just isolate like Scandinavian no. design. Uh, everything uh, fits together. So I hope I hope you think this is uh, interesting and and okay, <laughs> even though we're Swedes talking about French well, designers. Well, it's just a good name. Yeah, it's, it's a good name. Scandinavian design. Yeah, yeah, it's a, yeah. But if you like this video, please click thumbs up and subscribe. Yeah, and follow us on Instagram. Of course, we are called Scandinavian Design One O One. And that's also a lie. Yeah, that's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you for watching. Thank you.